Hi, Jan. What was your first computer? Uh, my first computer was some kind of Pentium, Pentium One. Whoa. I don't know. So exactly. a young guy. So it's like uh, yeah. yes, almost yesterday, you know. No ZX Spectrum, yeah, no so C C sixty four. Okay. No, it was Pentium computer with Windows ninety eight. Ninety eight. Um, okay. So uh, yeah. I started Windows with ninety five, and uh, ninety eight was the next one, of course. And funny story, a neighbor knew that I do something with programming, and he asked me, you know, uh, could you please help me with installation of Windows ninety eight? And I said, okay, no problem. And uh, this will take five minutes. And because of some hardware error or whatever, it just didn't work. So uh, I just deconstructed this entire computer, everything, you know, network card, everything. At the end, there was just CPU and it still didn't work. And the, and the problem was it appeared like two seconds on the screen before it, the, the, it tried to boot. We saw the error and then it crashed. So he had a VHS, VHS camera, you know, the, the old cameras, video cameras. So we filmed the screen uh, recorded the screen, but the resolution was too low, so he couldn't read it anyway. So this was my Windows 98, you know, <laughs> story. So what you did with your Pentium 1? Oh, um, yeah, that was at the beginning. That was uh, that was actually a hand-down computer to our family from uh, my uncle, who was an uh, enthusiast. Ent enthusiast. Uh, so he was really into computers in that time. So we basically got his computers after he got new ones. So. So okay. Was, I think for a few years it was that way, and uh, at the beginning I didn't really use this, use it for anything else than uh, playing around with uh, paint and uh, paint. The program that, yeah, the programs that were out there, and there was of course no internet. Um, Do you actually know uh, that there was a paint? There was a, like a YouTube back then. I remember YouTube screen cards where someone with the Microsoft Paint did amazing things, you know? It used paint to, 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 to do artistic stuff. So you have to look it up. So this is what I remember with Microsoft Paint. So this is, but Paint is like basic program, but uh, she or he, I don't know who, who it was, uh, used the paint and created really amazing stuff. And you pro yeah. played games or just? Ooh, uh, I didn't even play much games in the beginning. It was just, uh, the computer was there and for like for I think a year or something like that, there was just what was on it was on it, and we were playing with that. Uh, later, I was using a lot of uh, educational games that was quite popular for for a for a bit, and then I I what got what to, is an educational game? What is it? Uh, oof, we we had games like uh, traveling the world, and then you you were visiting different car countries and learning about the culture and the, ah. There was not X Expedia or something like this, not Expedia, Microsoft, uh, something with Pedia from Microsoft, not Expedia. Expedia, I think, is a company right now. It was called uh, from Microsoft. This is what I also had with Windows 95. It was like, there's not a game. It was like Wikipedia on a disk. In, yeah. Uh, in, yeah, you okay. Know, what's actually interesting, I think, is that we had, Slovenia is a small country, but already then we had a lot of educational games translated so I, I, I remember traveling the world, then how does it work? And then you were basically, it was a garage. You were walking around in the garage and then you clicked on something and the okay. guy explained how, how stuff works. Uh, so yeah, first it was games like that uh, when I was a child. Um, yeah, I, I remember I once uh, turned off uh, my uncle's computer and I accidentally left the, the CD tray open. Okay. And I thought that's that was gonna be a huge problem that I <laughs> okay. did something totally wrong. But then after that, I I got interested with uh, computers and I start first I start started playing around with different Linux uh, Linux stuff, uh, system so, stuff. So nothing nothing interesting happens on Windows. So you didn't start in no basic or GW basic or no. Oh, the first the first thing that I remember uh, was basic doing something with Visual Basic in. So in, back in school, in grammar, grammar school, uh, we had this one really, really good of a teacher who was uh, always pushing the best out of us, Okay. Uh, giving us interesting projects. So one year for Christmas season, he uh, put together a PC computer, uh, some electric boards and like a big sign with uh, letters, happy, happy new year or something like that. Mm -hmm. So each each letter had its own light bulb and they were connected with a relay to the computer and we 
could program that for a few weeks to crazy uh, to do different animations of how the letters are changing. Yeah. So yeah, that I think that was my first program. But uh, was it uh, already Pentium, right? Like computer, right? Yeah. Okay, so that probably he had a relay or something already attached to it, right? At the back. Yeah. Okay. Because uh, yeah, but yeah, great teacher actually. And this yeah. is the reason why you become excited in computing. Uh, yeah, probably that. And my my uncles, uh, both of them, I think they they both uh, one was really into computers and the other is really into all, all stuff with electronics. So I was growing up. Okay. In this what are your uncles doing right now? Bill Gates. Uh, <laughs> No, once in once in uh, uh, software development, and oh. other one is, yeah. But I mean, he's working on the product side, but yeah, he's involved with software development, and the other one is still working with uh, electronics. Oh, nice! Fix everything, basically. Okay, so um, yeah, I did it at school, and then uh, you got interested in Linux. So, I mean, if you already know Windows, why you started with Linux? Because. Uh, it was exciting to do something new. I I, okay. I remember I got a book somewhere. Uh, I think it was actually like a first. It was a series of articles in this one uh, computer magazine mm -hmm. during a course of one year, and then they put that in a book. Like it was basically just a how to use Linux for dummies kind of thing. But I was okay. like, wow, something new. That you have to try that. And then uh, I was playing around with Linux just for fun, basically. And you install Linux on the Windows machine? Yeah, I, I don't remember. Uh, I How think often I... do you did you had to re, to reinstall Windows because you install Linux? This is the the interesting part because I had the problem three times. At three times I screw up. I think the uh, bootloader, you know, the MBR. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, master boot I, record. Uh -huh. I think I started with a separate machine for that. That's an, another oh. great thing. With my uncle was that I was always having this second hand uh, computers that I could play around, so that okay. I didn't. Okay. I didn't br didn't break the main computer in the house, so that that was uh, okay. <laughs> I only had one, and the problem was back then. I remember I even experimented with two hard disks. The problem was back then. I think you could only boot from the. It was was it called master was, or, or or active or something? Yeah. There was one one disk where you could boot, and the other one didn't matter. So I tried you know, to swap the order for booting, but then and this was just crazy. So with one machine it was really dangerous to run yeah. at the beginning, Windows and Linux back then, right? I remember for a, for some time I was like do, doing a lot of reinstalls over and over again. Different yeah, yeah. Combinations. yeah. So yeah, that was fun for quite some time. So then you managed to boot Linux. What you did with Linux? I think first just like playing around with different desktops and mm -hmm. uh, the attractive thing, attractive thing then was that you could have like crazy animations that are basically use, useless, but you could um, make or desktops into a cube and then rotate mm -hmm. that cube mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So again, just playing around. And then I think uh, I started with web servers, uh, FTP servers for FTP. backup in the house. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we had we had that for a while. We had a computer for backups. You remember uh, X-Earth? I think it was X-Earth. This was at the beginning of Linux 3D Earth, which was now rotating according to the to the to the this yeah. X eyes, of course, from back because it was you know X eyes, X clock, and the Earth or X Earth or something. Yeah, I remember something like that. And and how how often do you screw up the X server? So you know, uh, it, it was really dangerous back then because if you uh, you had to 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 at least in my time, you know, you had to manually edit the the resolution of the screen. And it had to be compatible with your graphic cards, graphic de device. And it was really hard back then. If you screw it up, uh, you couldn't open the... So you had to knew that you have to kill the X-Server to have to know the terminal mode, and then you could fix it and launch the X-Server again. So also happened to you? No, I, I don't remember exactly this scenario, but I remember a lot of... Uh, set, a lot of setting with... Uh, this display stuff and yeah. So, so what I think is, uh, it was later if you started with Linux, you know, I started at the beginning where there is, yeah. uh, and, and if you do it later, it was everything fixed. And uh, amazing, uh, recently I installed Linux and the experience was even better than Windows, actually. Uh, recently I installed Windows 10 and it was crazy. I, 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 I mean, this for, for, for non programmers, I would say almost mission impossible to install Windows 10. I, I think I, I, I had to enter 
three different passwords. And at the end, Windows asked me whether I would like to have a PIN. <laughs> I said, okay, what, what are you asking me? And even I had to create an Outlook account to create is, uh, Windows. And they say, you have to create the Outlook account now, but you can immediately delete it. It's okay, what's, what's the point? So um, you did it? You tried to ever deinstall Windows from scratch right now? Mm, not for some time, but yeah. You should I... do it. So Windows XP or 2000 was easy, but uh, the 10 was crazy. I, I couldn't believe it. So how many passwords and pins and, and outlooks do I have to enter right now? Um, yeah, I usually just, like, I, I did it, I don't know, a few years, year, two back. I just tried to stay away from from all the managed accounts and cloud-related stuff, but... Yeah, sooner or later they just don't let you do anything else. Yeah, exactly, you. exactly. This is the same, same, same here. And uh, it's not Linux, uh, and this was amazing experience. I think recently Ubuntu, and this worked very smoothly. So there was actually I was surprised because uh, this was my old server which I built uh, from from scratch with now with custom parts, and it recognized everything. So it was like it, it was for me. For me, I, I already assume you now is Linux. I would spend like you know back in the days. A week you know, figuring out which chipset I have or whatever, but now it is the opposite. And Windows was actually more problematic than Linux nowadays, which this is how how it changed. Okay, nice. Uh, sorry. Um, now um, with Linux, you started programming on Linux as well, or what you did then? Um, so after the initial honeymoon phase with uh, <laughs> playing around, <laughs> I I remember that I didn't had uh, like a really really good uh, PC setup with. Uh, Linux running and everything was optimized and I could uh, boot my computer with my phone with some, I don't remember the exact, the exact protocol. So wake, basically it was Wake on LAN and I had remote desktops and uh, shell access from everywhere. And wow. that worked, worked for years, the years then. Um, I think slightly then, slightly motivated by Matrix movie, I, I guess, right? So if, if I hear you. Yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> then I, I was... I got I got involved with program programming quite quite late. Uh, I first I was like doing uh, ah first I was doing okay web pages and then PHP web pages, and then I had two interesting summer jobs, uh, which were basically just uh, there there was there was a local company uh, who who would just take me to be there for a summer and they said yeah we have this uh handhold windows device with mm -hmm. the barcode scanner and we would really like if you could make that to be a tool for like checking the inventory and stuff so but we we, we got that we don't know anything about it just figure it out so i think that was my first real real programming project it was in net and c sharp probably okay that was a summer of that, and then next summer I had I got a different project. It was, but but how you could do it because uh, you had just the basic experience from school, right? Yeah, I was just determined to okay to study as I as I was progressing. So that's probably because the the final product wasn't really uh, like excellent uh, mm -hmm. quality, but I did learn a lot in that okay. summer. Next summer, I was doing something else. So, so your first real language was C Sharp and uh, .NET, I guess, or or basic. Yeah, I, I think I think PHP was before that. Okay. So Is basic okay. PHP and then yeah, C Sharp. Uh, and then the next summer was, mm, I can't remember. It was I was just ext extending some C uh, CSM with some additional features that were doing some integration with the backend system there, and again it was. Complete everything was completely new to me. I was just learning uh, from day to day, and uh, actually, actually developed something somehow useful at the end of the summer. So those were the the first projects. And then I had uh, programming in high school, mm -hmm. and there were like eight of us maybe in, in that class. And when I was, was it? Which, which 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 year? Two thousand and five, six, seven. Oof. Yes, somewhere around then. I can't remember. I would have to calculate that. No, no, uh, just roughly, you know, because... Yeah, know. yeah. Uh, at the end of 2000, so 2010. Okay, then. okay. Um, yeah, and, like, we were... The course was... The class was on, like, basics of information technology, and we did some programming, and 
I was uh, the only one with that had some some knowledge, so I was uh, a su superstar programmer for them oh. at, at that point. But uh, we were we are just doing some basic Python stuff then there. But actually, we always do basic stuff, right? <laughs> yeah, if you think what you are doing, it, it is always sounds you know, I was just a no beginner, but everyone is a beginner because if I see what they're doing right now, is still at the end. If you manage to write, you know, simple code, I'm happy. If the code is complicated, then it's already something suspicious, right? I would yeah, say. Exactly. So uh -huh. um okay. So what happens then? So when you found about Java? I did have a book about Java. I still have it on my bookshelf. I don't remember why why I get why I got it. I was Probably I was just interested in all things related to to the computers. And so I, I think I actually read a book on Java too, but I guess I did some basic basic examples from the, from the book. But the real experience uh, I with Java started at the university. So when I was I entered the first year, there's a course on programming and you use Java there. So Okay, so you were more or less forced to learn Java. Yeah, yeah university was, in my year. Yeah, first 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 programming language that you touch then there and then in like at the beginning of third year uh, we were working with java enterprise edition and then i think at that point i really started to to like dive in and uh, study so, it so you like the more. enterprise java experience or you yeah i mean my first thoughts as a uh, real beginner uh, it was like a, a lot of new things. So uh, all of the sudden we have application servers and a lot of dependencies and, and Maven and built and uh, everything was broken all of the time, but uh, it's just a lot to take in and then you you get the grasp of it and you understand what's happening and then it gets better. So Do you remember which servers have you used back then? Yeah. Which servers have you used back then in the studies? Uh, study Wi-Fi or was it Glassfish or what? It was glass glassfish for the first year. Okay, interesting. So, probably V three. Yeah, probably. But uh, this was actually the, the from the Maven perspective. It it is fairly easy. So you don't only need one dependency, and uh, yeah, if you if you on if you're only a previous uh, experience with Java was uh, writing Hello World and oh uh, okay the Maven itself <laughs> is a magic yeah okay yeah, yeah, oh, then yeah. basic classes then the whole concept of maven is yeah, you're right. completely yes new. yesterday i had someone a developer uh, the uh, half an hour and he couldn't use maven because of proxy settings you know <laughs> so um okay nice and uh i think then then you started Zuri with java 5 i would say right this was java 5 java 6 time frame i assume yeah java 6 2012 i, I guess around yeah, around then, then some sometime around then. I know 2012 because uh, I found recently a conference talk I delivered. It was 2012 when I used JDK 1.6 <laughs> and Java 6. And this was the time frame of Glassfish V3. So I assume it was at that time frame. Yeah. And have you did something interesting during university time or just, you know, assignments and homeworks? So I, I finished this course and then uh, I got, there was an option to join the the research group uh, uh -huh. at the university and basically continue work with Java Enterprise there. So I was uh, working on like different uh, research programs, uh, implementing proof of concept stuff. Uh, what? Uh, so it was a great opportunity to learn a lot. So well, what you did, yeah, yeah, but which project were they back then? I was I, I was working first. I think the first thing, okay, the first thing that I did was. Uh, something with uh, JBoss Switcher, so for managing integrations. Okay. But that that didn't really take off. Uh, so I was just studying that, and then we left it there. And then I was working with uh, Java Server pages and mm -hmm. uh, doing some like I remember doing some validation logics logic for input fields for like special scenarios. And then we were doing some like. Uh, Proof of concept uh, implementation of a let's say like web application that could serve as a uh, management tool for 
managing some kind of assets, I don't remember. Okay. And uh, I was doing integrations with uh, JVPM and business rules. I started working with rules then. Mm -hmm. uh, so for a while I was in the JBoss, uh, JBoss rules, JVPM world. Okay, and how you like rules? Um, like I have two opposing experiences with yeah. rules. Now I'm curious. Yeah, on one side, I like really liked the idea and how and how it's implemented and how it works. So it, you can you can do a lot with rules. You can mm -hmm. really uh, deep in dive into it and like do a lot of useful stuff. Uh, but then on the other hand, business business rules uh, supposed to be like business rules for business users with mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like the I, I mean the whole concept is supposed to be that uh, some business person, business related person can just change a rule somewhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in my experience, um, that didn't uh, ev ever worked out as exactly. it should. So it always got complicated somehow. And mm -hmm. then you talked with clients and they're like, yeah, but we have to take that into account and that, and otherwise we do this. And then you cannot do that in the UI and you have mm -hmm. to program it down. And then it, you are doing that for a week and it becomes... Uh, very, very complicated. This was also my, my observation, all rule engines. So the promise was, you know, that the business department can change the, uh, very, the, the, the logic very flexibly without involving the IT. And what I found out is that sometimes the business department is not really interested, you know, in thinking like we think, if else. And they, they just would don't like their white or black. They, they would like to have something gray. And this is uh, becomes, uh, uh, or they're just not custom to, programming and whether we are visually programming or we are throwing charts or sequence diagrams at the end of the day is still programming and what it boils down that is the simplest possible way is actually to write java code right i mean this is or or, or some kind of code uh, it doesn't have to be java and uh, another thing what i uh, I, I thought you will mention that is with rules rules work like or still works you can just put the facts in the memory and then wait until it happens and sometimes nothing happens because you did a mistake you know this is the problem and this is really hard to debug then why nothing happened because if you're lucky you get the answer this is a little bit like almost i would say the predecessor of machine learning almost right so uh i would say and then if nothing yeah. happens or if you're back it's really hard hard to find debug right yeah exactly and you, you mentioned clients so, so your university worked with clients or was it like you know research no, that was some that was some uh, other project uh, okay that, that was a bit later um uh, that i was working with some clients in that but uh yeah the university uh so you left the university then and worked uh, in real world or <laughs> i'm working uh since i don't know i, I think that since I graduated with bachelor, I, am, I, I have always been working uh, part at the university and part okay. uh, somewhere else. So uh, it like depends. I'm basically freelancing on different projects. Interesting. So, so what I am actually doing, and um, and 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 some, 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 something interesting happens at the university. I mean, interesting. The research project are already interesting, but something else what you did so there was a research around enterprise java would i which university was it in Slo slovenia which one uh, or what's yeah, the university, name the university of ljubljana ljubljana okay so this is you you living you located in ljubljana right yeah because uh, because i i came here to study and i stayed here yeah it's a nice city yeah and how warm is it right now you know or how cold outside roughly roughly 10 degrees celsius yeah 15 my computer says nine nine okay so not that different so i would i shouldn't no. be je jealous okay so you you work as a freelancer and working in you delivering classes at the university right teaching classes yeah and exactly. what which which classes are they java enterprise or exactly <laughs> yeah yeah i so i i'm those are the now i'm this i i am now teaching classes that I was describing before that, ah, uh, that okay. was my first uh, touch with the Java enterprise. Okay, um, so you're still teaching enterprise Java, no? Nice. Yeah. Okay, and and you are a freelancer out, freelancer outside the university, right? Yeah. This is actually great because um, I uh, studied at. Um, University of Applied Science, I think. Not, you know, the real university, like, you know, the technical university or how to call it. 
And what I really enjoyed was all my professors, they worked actually uh, for at the in industry. So they were not like, you know, just theoretical professors. So they, they always told us stories from, from the fields, which I really enjoyed. So if you are spending your time at the university and at the same time spend your time hacking something, this is a great for the students because you can tell them, look, this is what I saw and this is how it works. And, you know, it, is a, it's, it, it becomes more interesting than just the theory. Because I think computer science, the, the theory can be really boring, extremely boring. So you can, you can bore the students to death. If you start, you know, with all the information theory, just, you know, it is even worse than math. But if you do it the other way around, that so you show okay, how it, what happens in practice and then start with the theory, then it makes sense, more sense, right? Yeah, yeah. I also think it's uh, like really important to to do the real examples and to have knowledge from the field. To you can easily you can ha help students uh, understand the the field uh, more deeply if you have experience mm -hmm. yourself. Okay, so now the question is when and how cumulus happened so how you are involved in cumulus so somewhere here in between here um so between my my beginnings with java enterprise and me teaching java enterprise uh someone in between the cumulus e enterprise uh, so cumulus ee project started um by whom by you no by one of my colleagues uh by my it, he was my uh my schoolmate at the university mm -hmm. uh Tilan, Tilan Faganel, uh, and he was uh, working on that uh, during his studies with Matyash uh, mm -hmm. Juric, uh, and like they developed the so i think it was a batch of a bachelor thesis on oh. on like a draft of uh microservice framework for java enterprise edition so the, okay the idea there was so we have we have Java, Java EE, Java Enterprise, which is like, used pretty heavily mm -hmm. in in real world. We have uh, those uh, application servers that uh, could be quite heavy and uh, would take their time and resources. And on the other hand, we have uh, uh, new cloud technologies emerging and containers mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So the idea was how to bridge the gap and to make Mm -hmm. Java EE like optimized for cloud native mm -hmm. architectures. So mm -hmm. the uh, it started at the university as a uh, like as a project there, and then it grew uh, from that to to a community that now takes care of the for the project and that's uh, mm -hmm. actively actively developing it. How Cumulus is optimized? So if you co compare Cumulus to Glassfish, why is Cumulus better for the clouds than Glassfish? Um, yeah, I was thinking about that uh, yesterday at night. Um, the I think the one one of the main reasons is that um, like we we started from basically from the scratch. So idea was how to how to run Java Enterprise as light as possible, and uh, the the first version of the Cumulus uh, framework was just was just a bunch of stuff that bootstrapped all all the necessary dependencies that mm -hmm. things run. So the minimal set of dependencies so that I think we were one of the first that to do that. And the other thing, uh, the other difference is that I think all of the other, other players, at least at the beginning, uh, tried to, uh, like repurpose their existing application servers. So mm -hmm. yeah, we have, we have Wi-Fi. Let's try to, let's try to like modify, uh, repackage, re refactor exactly. that, mm -hmm. yeah, into something that will start up uh, independently. And I think here's the the main difference. So the, mm -hmm. we we didn't have that, so it it all started from 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 the from. What I'm asking is because you know Riz, Riza Raman, right? You know him, yeah. yeah. And he said, okay, you have to look at Cumulus because it's cloud native. Uh, this was like you know five or four years ago. And I say, why should you do this? Because uh, Payara and Whitefly for me are light enough. This is not like I, I, I couldn't believe that uh, other framework is uh, lighter or significantly smaller because, um, you know, the heavyweight servers, I, I heard this all the time. And 
back then, what I remember, clients asked me, we don't need EGBs, we only need GSF. Can you remove EGB container? And I took a look at the glassfish and the SGA container was tiny. Then, you know, uh, it, it's not like the servers were bloated. Uh, they were actually pretty small and they were already, already modularized. What I remember, I don't, have, have you attended ever Java 1 conference? No. Unfortunately. Because there was, uh, at the Sun Times, they had a t-shirt. I still have it. This is uh, uh, java minus jar glassfish dot jar. So they started actually with the bootable server. And I think this was before Oracle. No, I think I know it's before Oracle bought Sun. So it was uh, probably 2008 or something. And they were very early. And um, so the ideas were always around. And the servers, I saw lots of projects. I'm also a freelancer. And the servers were not a problem rather than, you know, Lots of dependencies and crazy architectures and stuff like that. And then I ignored Cumulus until um, I do the AirHacks workshops at Munich Airport. And there was a group of people who attended the workshops. And I asked them, which server are you using? And they said, Cumulus. And it turned out, this is a, a Slovenian company. I actually forgot the name. But they have something to do with uh, oil or raffineries or something like that. And they are using Cumulus. And it sounds like they are also committers, what I understood. To, uh, to Cumulus and um, I absolutely now I remember I actually it was my to do to find out the name of the company but it's like Slovenian company which cares about oil and uh, a huge company um, and I say okay then this is a thing so if 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 a huge project uses Cumulus and Cumulus is now uh, uses enterprise APIs it could be also interesting to other projects and then I took a look at that and it looked reasonable it's not it put it it was well documented so okay this is interesting option. And what also happened, at the beginning, we only had Java Enterprise. So it was not that exciting for me because, you know, Glassfish, Whitefly, Open Liberty is also tiny. But now we have MicroProfile. So uh, with MicroProfile in Java Enterprise, so I see the point that the Cumulus can repackage things differently. And just, okay, so an um, uh, interesting project. And the name is great, actually, Cumulus. Great choice, by the way, right? And, um, and then I took a look at GitHub and I saw that it's actually a very active project still. Yeah, it is, yeah. So, uh, which other companies are using Cumulus? You know that? Is uh, Slo lots of companies in Slovenia? Or? Um, yeah, we are, uh, we are actively working with uh, quite a few companies in, companies in the region. So, uh, there's, a, there's a list on the, on the web page. Uh, but um, I, I think that's also one of the, one of the great things in this project that we um we have like uh, real feedback so we actually uh, help companies use cumulus in their projects and we get feedback and we optimize stuff and that basically that drives the development forward so we have motivation we have ideas what to do and how to proceed so yeah lots of companies has, uh, just open the page akrapovic uh, uh austrian social insurance yeah that's interesting because I mean this is a uh, in Austria so um, CyberGrid Austria as well then EBCont Austria so you have lots of Austrians so I think they need holidays in Slovenia right so they use Cumulus and you invite them then uh, NTT Chile wow Abanca no Petrol I think this could be the company yeah. I'm talking about so they they are really nice guys Adriatic Slovenia looks like then Snaga no idea. Energetica Ljubljana, this is like a Ministry of Public Administration. And uh, yeah, Ministry of Justice, crazy. Uh, Postbank, Slovenia. So lots of companies, Informatica, City Tech, Tovarna, something, SRC and IRC. So Chile is interesting in lots of Austrian projects. And um, what you claim is the smallest jar. And fully cloud native. So, uh, smallest jar. What what it means? Smallest jar. There was a um, performance study. It was, was some time ago. So it was like the, the it was like an evaluation setup, and it, the idea was okay. We want to implement uh, this and this API with uh, Jux RS and CDI and I think JPA. Mm -hmm. And let's do let's try and do that with uh, different different frameworks. Try to package that with like the smallest set of dependencies, and let's see what happens. And the smallest jar means that as, that we had the smallest jar, so that the final jar size was like the smallest um, amongst 
uh, all the participants and we also got really really uh, really good uh, startup times there uh, we were the, the fastest uh, framework in the in the performance uh, test so uh, great do you remember some numbers that, that don't have to be correct but how fast cumulus starts so um, i would say a uh, crud hello world jpa projects startup time hello world what the yeah. students are doing i assume you force your students also to use cumulus right yeah or gently uh, forcing you know so <laughs> And yeah. uh, so h- how far, f- how fast it starts with student machines? It, it, what? Mm-hmm. A few seconds. A few seconds, okay. And uh, are, you have, uh, are you building or are you creating uh, super, uh, Uber jars or Fed jars or the, are they layered? So you have one, you know, the packaging, the business logic, and then the dependencies. Yeah, um, we, we started with, uh, we actually started like the, the first, first version uh, was, uh, using the exploded packaging so that you had uh-huh. uh, for the dependencies and then you had your application so and then uh we added uh uber jars so everything's in there and now we are uh working on uh optimizing the packaging for docker containers so that you have different layers um so th- this is coming soon i think i think it's in the final phases of testing mm-hmm. um, and since we since we are up we were trying to optimize the jars to run in Docker. We then also added some features to build the Docker files automatically and just ah, try to nice. optimize the whole, so, the whole process. Which features Cumulus has, which others don't? For instance, like this, you know, Docker files, or what? What, what is the added value of Cumulus on top of MicroProfile in Jakarta API? Something proprietary stuff, which you like? Yeah. Uh, first, I think that um, we already we already implemented. Uh, some things that came with some things that came with micro profile we already did uh, before that so we we start the, one of the first things that we started with was the configuration uh, extension which uh, we then when micro profile uh, released its own version of micro profile of the conf- configuration uh, library we just integrated the two together okay. were they similar uh, yeah, the the concepts were similar. The both use uh, different uh, configuration sources with different priorities, so we just mapped that. Uh, what's uh, what's an additional value in our uh, our uh, extension is that we uh, we support uh, uh, console and etcd configuration servers out of the box. So oh. there's there's an uh, just additional dependency, and it's then the configuration framework is auto configured with additional sources and the priorities are there and we support watches and all that comes with that and namespaces. So but this, is, this is actually great. What it means is if you are running Kubernetes, you get etcd for free because Kubernetes uses etcd. So it means with Cumulus, you, I could reuse etcd for configuration. So I can plug directly, to pull my configuration from etcd. Yeah. And this is actually great. So this is a really cloud native feature now. So not like, you know, talking about cloud native. This is because Kubernetes is everywhere. Yes, yeah, that's... Uh... That's what we are trying to do, actually, or, or that's one of the the main uh, goals is to try to uh, try to align with Kubernetes and other cloud native mm-hmm. features. So mm-hmm. uh, another another thing that's uh, uh, that we we added quite quite early is the uh, service discovery extension, which uh, again uses uh, could can use a console or etcd as a backend. And it uh, like work. You can use service discovery uh, without any container orchestration. You just need like a back- backend server for that. Uh, we were working on like uh, supporting different versions of services, and then now we are working on um, different migration scenarios. So you can easily introduce canary releases by just extending service discovery. Ah, but, this is... but an- another thing there is that. Uh, Service discovery extension, for example, is also aware that the the services could run in uh, Kubernetes, and uh, if you if you deploy to Kubernetes, you just say, okay, this is deployed in this and this cluster, and then services know that uh-huh, we are now in the same cluster, and they can communicate uh, directly in the cluster, uh, or you can connect with them from outside the cluster, so you can. You can actually bridge the gap between Kubernetes services and non-Kubernetes services if you would have such an 
a use case. But the idea is that if if the extension knows that it's been deployed to Kubernetes, then then works in a works in a different way. So what it does, it probably goes to Kubernetes, asks for other services with a specific label, and gets the IP addresses, right? Yeah. So this is the what also Prometheus does. It's another example of cloud native. This is what this is the way how how the services find each other in on Kubernetes, right? Yeah. I'm really uh, surprised. So it's really a really pragmatic project. As as is, uh, I mean, it comes with immediate added value, not just you know something for the students. If you so the Cumulus project it consists of Cumulus EE, so that's the main framework, mm -hmm. and then there's a bunch of extensions, so additional projects and mm -hmm. so the configuration extensions, service discovery, and so on, so so on. And like some of uh, some of them are like uh, really mature, so have been like developed for a few years and have been used in different scenarios. And some of them are at the beginning of mm -hmm. their uh, Mm -hmm. uh, of their life cycle, so you can easily see that some, like, so, and some are, let's say, it's more, uh, more uh, educational or research based, and others are like produ fully production ready. So, for example, we uh, like a few years back we did uh, an Ethereum integration. So, how to easily connect to Ethereum? Uh, we are working on different feature flags. Uh, uh, Tools so how to integrate feature flags into the the framework. Ah, this is also so interesting. Can... Feature uh, feature flags. So what what it means is that you get like extension, I, I guess, extension of microprofile config, which is reconfigurable on the fly or something like this, right? Or what do you mean by feature flags? Because what yeah. I would suspect is like a kind of a boolean, where you can ask, you know, am I active or not, or what? Yeah, exactly. So currently. Currently, the the extension integrates with one of the feature flag providers and uh, gets values from there. But the the actual added value is on the internal API. So how to provide feature flags APIs in Cumulus so that you developers could use feature flags and have a pluggable backend so that you could get the values from let's say. Uh, configuration servers or some feature flag servers or mm -hmm. whatever the I think the added part there is the actual APIs and like a unified layer for feature flags in Cumulus. The extensions you're talking about uh, I just found as well the link they're actually called projects from your website and I just yeah. took, a, took a look on that and uh, what's uh, uh, interesting here of course Cumulus event streaming Kafka is of course a uh, now very popular, but uh, Cumulus cores. This small thing, hugely valuable because you need cores you know, everywhere. If you're building SPA, so cores. Then uh, Swagger, of course. Um, then <clears throat> gRPC. So it comes with gRPC support, which is also nice because then you can have service-to-service uh, -service communication in a async way via HTTP2 without JAXRS. GraphQL, GraphQL. Is it actually the GraphQL support microprofile GraphQL, or this is your own spec? You know, no, that, this is uh, our own because we started that uh, before Mark microprofile. I have to, I have to admit that I don't know what's the latest development in that in that project. But the idea here is to, like, again, provide programmable APIs to expose uh, GraphQL uh, mm -hmm. uh, queries and mutations uh, as easy as possible. What's uh, also interesting and useful is Cumulus EE version. So expose version details of your microservices. So I always did it by myself, you know, trying to find class get resource, uh, meta inf, and try to scan and return the uh, POM. So if it comes out of the box, this is a nice touch. So it's very pragmatic. So this is uh, this is actually a nice thing. So I uh, expose that's version. Actually, mm -hmm. That's actually something that we didn't think of uh, like right away, but it came from out uh, uh, one of our uh, clients. So the idea and then we were like yeah of course that should be there and i also think it's like really useful to have that and mm -hmm. um, have a consistent way of providing versioning information mm -hmm. and ethereum is interesting because of course it's a uh, no more that buzzword right now i think bitcoin is almost no more interesting for developers yeah i would say one year ago there was a huge hype with uh, Ethereum and, and now it's, uh, it's flat out, but it's still interesting from the technical perspective, but people find out that it's uh, hard to, to make money with, uh, <laughs> with, uh, with GPUs. And now it is no more debt, you know, IP, but 
Um, what you can do with Cumulus EE Ethereum? Do you have some use cases which are interesting or? Cumulus EE Ethereum is uh, a, um, a, an extension that um, lets you connect to the blockchain, blockchain and uh, subscribe to events and uh, uh, read some data or something like that. So this started like a few years back and the idea was to, okay, let's, okay, we have Ethereum, uh, we have Java, what's the easiest way to interact with that? Uh, so that were, that were the starting points and we started there. Uh, currently that's uh, one of the, maybe one of the least act active project, but uh, it's, I, it's still uh, interesting, I think. So you you can interact with the blockchain. Mm -hmm. Just a spontaneous idea because you mentioned you know the your build system and the jars. What we had in the past problems with Fed jars in production, of course, or Uber jars, is that um, if you think about this, you don't know what's inside, right? So on with application servers, it's not a huge problem because the war is basically empty and only contains the business logic. And what's inside the application server, you know, because you know the version. So if you ship a fetch jar, so uh, no idea what's inside. So if some, if, if you have to fix something in production, security patches is really hard. So I don't know whether it is exactly the functionality of your Cumulus E version, but it would be nice if your build process would create a list of dependencies, which I used. So that you know, you know, if there is a security issue with Jackson version 1.2, these services are affected. And what you could do, I thought about this already, expose this uh, library information as, as labels or annotations in, in Kubernetes. So you could actively scan, you know, you say, give me yeah. who uses Jackson 1.0, and then you get a list of all services, and then you know, okay, they, they, these services have to be patched, right? Yeah, Some, interesting. Yeah. yeah. Something that we should have a look at, yeah. So, uh, can you buy support for Cumulus? Yeah, there's, uh, there's an option for that. Uh, who gets um, the money? You. No, support, support, support. <laughs> uh, you get support by um, the link takes you to the like the company that backs the Cumulus team mm -hmm. and uh, it goes through that and it then goes to the developers. But who is the company? I mean, this is a, you are also a committer, right? Cumulus committer. Yeah. And the company is not you? This is some, some other entity, right? Uh, that's Sunez. It's, it's stated on the... Okay. Um... Are they also committers or are they are just gathering the money? No, no, no. They are, <laughs> uh, the Cumulus team is part of the, of the Sunesis company. So, ah, uh, are you Sunesis. a part of the team? No. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So you guys are working for the same company. Sunesis is the name of the company, right? So, so it's not entirely true what you said, right? So you're not entirely freelancer. You're working for a company called Sinesis. Yeah, I'm free freelancing for a company. Uh, you are freelancing for a company now. Now you, now we have it. So you are a professor freelancing for Sinesis in other companies. And okay, so um, so you can use Cumulus for free. And if you buy commercial support, what what I get? You know that? What is uh, that depends. Mm -hmm. Um, that actually depends on what you what you would want. Uh. Uh, you can get basic support. Uh, you can uh, work with the team closely. Uh, uh, you can request additional features. Uh, I mean, it's all it's all nego negotiable. So um, Machar will probably tell more about that uh, when he's on the podcast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I will also ask him. So, what what were are your contributions to contrib uh, to Cumulus? Oh, my contributions. Um, I started with Cumulus, Cumulus quite early. So first I was working on quite extensively on the configuration and service discovery stuff back then. And those, were, those are, uh, were two of the biggest projects. And then I was helping with this and that. And then I was uh, leading the technical side for, for, I don't know, year two, I don't remember. So I was uh, in charge of the all the 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 development so with the, and the releases and the, uh, communication with uh, with uh, clients and uh, helping with issues and uh, implementing micro profile so uh, I did that uh, for uh, oh that, that's yeah. interesting so so you have full micro profile support yeah and you implemented all the micro profile APIs. Or are, uh, are using small RAI or something like that? For some of them, we are using small RAI, and the others we have implemented. It depends on the on the actual. And you know which that. one 
are implemented by you and which on ones are from small right oh no i would have to have a look uh, uh i know that definitely the configuration is our implementation but uh a lot of things that are taken from small right uh some of the things that are taken from small right have the again have some additional added value so for example for metrics mm -hmm. uh, metrics is also something that we started before micro profile and i think that at some point we changed to small right implementation uh, but we still have a lot of stuff that we added before. So, for example, you can easily integrate integrate uh, metrics with with logging extensions. So, you can redirect the metric status to I don't know uh, Elk Stack and have it there. So it's just one additional dependency, or export that to Prometheus and things. So there are like another add-ons to the whole metrics thing. Okay. Metrics is interesting part because the microprofile metrics have uh, I always confuse the name. It's not scopes. A registry types, right? So we have metrics slash application. Yeah. For instance, and what I did actually create a GitHub issue. Um, my what I would like to have is additional types. So uh, my idea would be to have you know metrics slash application slash uh, communication discovery. So my own uh, my own scopes or path or types. And the reason being is because uh, we use metrics extensively in projects for business metrics or, you know, more application-specific metrics, not just the generic technical stuff. And what MicroProfile told me, say, they're thinking about removing the registry types altogether. I was like, this is crazy because then the metrics are completely unusable for me because then I get the millions of metrics, which is a flat thing. And they told me, yeah, but Micrometer is doing things, or Spring Boot is doing this. Like, who cares about Spring Boot? From, I, I would rather would like to have no a tree-like metrics and uh, like a package structure in Java, I think. So even in some projects, we have one-to-one -one mapping between business components, which are Java packages and metrics. So the expectation is if you have a package, let's say ordering, I would expect in the order component or namespace having some gauges or counters at least which are telling what happens inside the component, right? So this is, I mean, this is not that strange and this works well in practice. So uh, what's your take on that? So, uh, I mean, do you see the point of having sub-metrics or you see everything or, or everything has to be flat, flat? No, I agree with you that uh, the the metrics should be like, have clear and extendable structures so that you can yeah. arrange them however you like. Because I, I don't even get the argumentation. Be, be, because uh, it seems like there are two opposites uh, use cases. One is like metrics which we don't care about. No, they are just there. So th this is what I get. So, so metrics which can be auto-generated by the framework, you could expose all the frameworks you like as a, as a cumulus, but I don't care how you generate it. So you can use micrometer, whatever you like to generate your metrics. But my metrics, which are explicitly create, let's say JMS like, you, you, I saw extension AMQP, also interesting one. So if I get messages to my system in the messages of wrong type, it would be nice to have a metric, which you know, increase a counter. Okay, I, I received a message with this poison message of, of wrong type. So there is no way that you can do such a metrics from outside because you don't see, you know, the, you cannot understand my, my business logic. Right? Agreed? Agreed. Okay, perfect. You are the committer number number two, you know that? Uh, yeah, I haven't checked that for a while, but I can believe that. Yeah, I checked that because uh, the uh, the number one is a guy from London, surprisingly. His name is uh, Thielen. Yeah, Tra that's. Uh, I was mentioning him before, so he, he's the one that, that started the whole thing. With ah, Josh. okay. But uh, yeah, exactly. And uh, he's... Uh, I breeze building large, highly scalable cloud solution. This is his, his thing. So another idea for Cumulus extension, just because we talk about the metrics, um, there's also microprofile fault torrents, and there is you no know, discussion service meshes with versus fault torrents in microprofile, right? So what's who is judge of what? So in my opinion, a service mesh can never, you know, have the same quality of circuit breaking or retry or timeouts than we because the service mesh only observes the external communication and we are the application developers we are exactly knowing what's going on but what you could do and this is actually um and the cloud native foundation about to be specified or they are thinking about that that uh, the service mesh could ask us how we are doing and we could expose additional data and this could be used for routing this could be also interesting yeah. you know cncf extension for cumulus right yeah Interesting. Yeah. Who drives actually Cumulus such ideas? So uh, who 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 thinks about the features? I mean, you you will have to have some 
Cumulus Brain <laughs> consult yeah. you? Yeah. I don't know if we mentioned. I mean, Matias, Matias Juric is the is the the lead of the project. Ah, okay. Uh, as I'm as. As I mentioned before, so he he started uh, the whole thing with uh, one of his students. Then and he's uh, the he's taking uh, he's leading the projects in then and he's the uh, he's the one that uh, always have uh, always has a lot of ideas on what to do, where to go next. And okay. it's usually that we cannot uh, actually uh, do everything, but uh, we always try to do the the most interesting st stuff first. Which ideas do you have? Do you have something which you really would like to implement with Cumulus? Your personal thing? Uh, my personal thing? Um, I really look forward to the uh, support for di different uh, uh, packaging times that we uh, were mentioning before. And there are, there are a, lot of, a lot of things that I would like to, to add in the, in, in the core of the, of the framework, but that's... Just say it, because Matthias won't listen to this, so... <laughs> no, no, it's not that we we don't want to do it. It's just as a developer, I have a like a good view overview in what's happening. Yeah, yeah. let's. I'm interested. So, uh, for example, I know there's a uh, there was an idea for uh, for having uh, an CDI uh, events for configurations changes, for example. Mm -hmm. So uh, <laughs> that's something that I always had uh, like at the back of my backlog, never got to it. And, so what um, means if the configuration changes by external something? There's external config configuration servers, yeah. So uh -huh. they could ping you so, then, or you will have to pull that, the that's, server. That's already that's already implemented. So when you uh, use configuration server, mm -hmm. you um, you can subscribe to changes. But mm -hmm. what you have to do is you you implement a a bin a CDI bin that uh, calls the act the 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 recent configuration values and when the values in config server are changed mm -hmm. the server pings the the cumulus microservice and the core framework updates the the value in the in the bin so when you call uh, get value you always get the latest value mm -hmm. but the additional idea was to also have uh, uh, events for that so that uh, you could subscribe to events and uh, mm -hmm. react to that in your logic this is a little bit contradictory to immutable infrastructure, but it's absolutely needed. So I got projects asking me over and over again, because usually, you know, in the perfect world, you will just restart the service, but it can take too long. This is all, yeah. And, uh, yeah, next one. No. Next idea. Next idea. Um, I guess there are, there are that's, uh, that's, I think, also in somewhere in the Kumbos backlog. It's a... Uh, uh, more integrations with uh, with Kubernetes, as you mentioned before, uh, for metrics example, uh, uh, using annotations for that. So I think there's a lot of uh, a lot of uh, potential to to connect to to the Kubernetes and to just exchange data on that annotation, so read annotation or something like that. So this direction is also something that uh, could be researched. And I'm working on. I'm also doing a PhD, so uh, ah. but really slowly. Uh, and in my PhD, I'm working on uh, different uh, different update strategies. So how to how to update microservice application without uh, like central supervision. So instead of like having uh, core orchestration doing the, the updates, I'm trying to do that with uh, choreography so that and the microservices so somehow manage themselves and update so almost almost peer-to-peer -peer technology right something like yeah this. exactly that's the idea and that's uh so that's i'm working on that as uh like uh, i'm working on a research paper and the uh, proof of concept implementation is one as a again as an extension to kumo so if okay when when that gets finished it will probably also be published there so are you aware of jackstar project jackstar you heard about mm -hmm. that jxta JXTA doesn't ring a bell now. Okay, JXTA Jackstar is uh, an old uh, an old Sun Microsystems project, and it was used for peer to peer technology, and it worked actually fairly well. So you will find the sources somewhere, and they had discovery protocol, and they had something like uh, gossip protocol already, and uh, back then, I already talked the story, I told the story of the podcast, but. Um, I was in train with uh, wild researchers, and at the end, uh, the idea was to implant a small computer to every pick. And they, if they saw each other, they knew that they 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 they, they met, right? And they could exchange 
and they could exchange uh, data. And the idea was that the PhD students from, from the wide research, if they caught one pick, they got the data from the entire family. And uh, this was peer-to-peer, -peer and uh, these uh, Jackstar worked with algorithms called Walker. So you could just, you know, the um, there was a walking algorithm who, you know, walked like an agent, almost Java agents, who walked through all the nodes and you gather the data. And uh, it was really interesting. I think it could help you in your research because everything was done. And this was the XML protocols were done. There were even Jackstar sockets ready to use. So you could exchange information using the sockets. And a uh, funny story is um, I told this about uh, in a conference the story about Jackstar and 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 peer to peer back then and one of the and then i got an email that someone quit the job and they created with Jackstar for you know Oktoberfest is like crazy drinking stuff in germany so uh and he created a, 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 a an app back then which worked on feature phones they were before smartphone for Oktoberfest so that um if you was in the in the in near of another person and uh, uh, the, the both you know both uh, cellular phones found found each other. Then uh, you you just uh, send a small beacon or something like this to the other to the other uh, phone. And then uh, if this phone f uh, you know met another phone, then you knew okay this other guy could be interested for you as well. And actually, this would be great for Corona right now for pandemic. Yeah, I thought I, I thought about this is exactly what what this was you know misused for drinking games or whatever they did with it. Now it will be the ultimate Corona app actually. And so, so Jackstar, this is what I will ask you the next time, uh, whether you took a look on that. And uh, we, I also used, created proof of concept for Jackstar for cars back then, like jam traffic detection, you know, because if I, if, if a car uh, is near the other car, the, the next car can ask, you know, how it looks in your case. And, and then you can, you can go from yeah. car to car. And back then it was crazy. So at the, the telecommunication, telecommunication companies, they say I should stop, stop talking about this Jackstar because if you think about this, if you, if the, you know, the mesh network of the devices is high, they, they don't need the antennas anymore. So you can, you can send, you know, from, from, from device to device, the, uh, the messages back and forth. So I'm really glad that you're doing something similar because what I wanted really to ask you, whether you plan to create an own ingest service for Kubernetes. Because there is right now you have to install HR proxy or, or something. And actually you could use the Cumulus for that. Yeah, we uh because I don't think we talked about that yet, but yeah, that's interesting. Because uh you, Kubernetes doesn't come with uh, there is a thing is called contour, right? This is what they are working on it. This is like the ingest service, the load balancer, which is going to be standardized. And um, there is a HA proxy on OpenShift. This is like the standard ingest or the uh, the route service. And actually, if you do research with the services, it's not exactly peer-to-peer, -peer, but uh, a specific Cumulus instance could take over and be you know, the public point of, of the ingest service from, from Kubernetes. And then implement you know the rolling updates or whatever strategy you have right yeah i'll think about that but how you I, I mean what you will have to do is you will have to have transactional peer-to-peer -peer communication because if you don't have the central point in just all your services have to be directly visible to the outside world right oh no my my idea there is to um uh to rely on on an so for now, the idea is to rely on an existing uh, service discovery mechanism. So, uh, yeah, but still, I mean, what, what you would like, to, what you don't like to have is a central point, right? Yeah, that is what I understood. But the central point is there in Kubernetes because this is the load balancer. So everything goes to the central points because yeah. the central point has the SSL certificate and exposes the IP address as a route, right? Yeah. So you have the central point already. And usually the central yeah. point provides the rolling updates. So this is what asks, you know, all the other services, what is the readiness? What are you ready or not? And, and then it will reroute the traffic or not to the services, right? Yeah, exactly. But I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not assuming or I'm not relying on Kubernetes on anything. I'm just trying, ah. to, I'm trying to find an alternative for that. So, uh, I mean, it's, that's a research question. It's, I'm, I'm not yet on a, like... Uh, in a product phase, I just want to try, want to solve the problem of uh, accepting the new version. So, deploying new version and accepting it without uh, without a third party component. So, what you could do is you would need something like a sidecar. I mean, Kubernetes again or a proxy, which uh, takes influence on the readiness probe, right? 
because you can then say uh, I'm not ready and then whether we have the central point or not then we won't receive any traffic and then you can replace the actual service yeah so you like split pot or something like this so interesting interesting stuff you're doing so I'm, I'm really curious about your idea about Jexta you will find books on materials this is like well, lots of research projects about Jexta yeah definitely 2003 okay Question, where people can find you on the internet? Do you have, you know, I, 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 the problem is nowhere. So I try to, to reach you and uh, it is almost impossible. You don't have Twitter, right? Yeah, I'll have to do something about it. Um, probably GitHub. The... GitHub. Yeah, they can, I, they I can write GitHub. you issues. So on GitHub, yeah, wait a second. This, this, this actually next time I will write you an issue. Yeah, that's, We should meet, that's, you know, on, on podcast again. So uh, okay. Jan, oh, I try to pronounce your last name. Mesnarich. Yeah. Yeah, is was yeah. say say uh, Jan Mesnaric. 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 And uh yeah, this is J Mesna Mizna M E Z N A. If someone would like to 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 reach you, then have to create an issue for you. Say hey, I yeah. would like to talk to you. This is like polling, right? So you have to poll you and not subscribe. <laughs> exactly. And uh yeah, and the uh Cumulus EE is the name of the project, ee.cumulus.com. And uh you can buy support or not. And uh, yeah, seems like a nice framework. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, I would like, really, like to re-invite you back. It really depends how, how fast you are going with your research work, but this seems to be interesting stuff. We can talk about that if you're interested or allowed to. I don't know. Is, are you allowed to talk about that or is it like a secret until it's revealed? I have no idea about PhDs. No, it's not a secret. I, I, I would like to finish that like in the next few months and then can talk about it. Perfect. So let's do this. So uh, see you then in summer or spring or something like that. Thank yeah. you. Bye. Okay. Thank you for having me.